Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church, Fort Smith, Arkansas, on finally a sunny morning. I'm so happy to see the sunshine. Uh, we appreciate all the people who are here and those with us virtually online. Please take a moment to greet the people around you. I love to see the way y'all love on each other first thing in the morning. Please stand and we will sing together an opening hymn, number 492, Many Are the Light Beams. Please check the back of your bullet, uh, bulletin for um, 
the schedule of the week. We will, elders will meet downstairs immediately following worship. There's a DWF board meeting this week, lunch bunch at Larry's Pizza, small groups and choir rehearsal on Wednesday. Also, uh, Church Women United will be meeting Friday at uh, U Unity Missionary Baptist Church here in Fort Smith. Um, things I saw in the newsletter include, um, we are all set up now uh, for online giving. Um, I went through and clicked all the links and it is really, easy and you got a lot of options and that's a, gonna be a good tool for anyone who prefers to uh, give to the church online. Uh, it's, it'll be a great convenience. Um, I got a letter from the stewardship ministry this week, I hope everybody did, which included a pledge card for uh, consideration of what you would like to pledge to support for the church this year. If you didn't get one, there are additional cards on that table kind of to the left in the narthex. Next week, we will turn in our pledges and uh, celebrate with a uh, fish dinner, which is traditional for this church. We've upped the chicken availability, so if you don't like fish, we got some chicken too, and it'll be a, a good meal for all. Um, oh, sign ups for the Naturals game to go see uh, the Naturals play on June 4th. Uh, make sure you get your reservation in by May 21st. That's going to be a fun, fun activity, and anybody can show up. Um, the youth are also accepting volunteers to help them with a yard project they're going to be doing May 21st after church, and um, if you want to show up and work, you are welcome. I was, there was a prayer concern that was brought to my attention. Donna and Martha Oglesby uh, will be having some doctor's appointments coming up that they want us to keep them lifted up uh, with concerns for how that all comes out. That's all I got. To reiterate briefly, uh, we will be collecting our pledge cards this next week, May 7th. And I want us to understand that that, that on our end, all that does, um, well, let me say this. A pledge card is non-binding. We don't take anyone to court or follow up on it. You can add, you can subtract, you can change as you see fit, but what that does on our end is that it lets us anticipate our budget a little bit better. And what I find it does on, on uh, y'all's end, on all of our end, is it, it helps us to uh, find that number, to find that amount, to hone in on what we feel called to, and then it makes it real simple, not worrying if you're not doing enough or doing too much, you just, you know your number ahead of time. And so that will be uh, something we're getting into next week. Uh, let's see, a few other announcements. I do understand that Jeff Jeffries, uh, he has uh, pretty advanced um, cancer, and so if you all would uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, similarly, you may notice that in the pews ahead of you, we have sharp pencils, we have the welcome cards replaced. Uh, our children's ministry did great work re-upping those this morning. Yeah, oh yeah. It is always great to see, uh, the church was designed to be intergenerational, and it's always great to see whenever every age group can be involved in their own ways. But with that, let's go ahead and transition into the church rejoicing in good news. This is our chance to share birthdays, anniversaries, and good news of all kinds. I got a, something I like to say. Uh, on behalf of my mother and my sisters, you all have been very kind in your friendship and fellowship uh, in this uh, last week, and I just want to express to you all on behalf of my family our, our gratitude. Um, 
Zeke and I became great great grandparents this morning oh. at 727. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a little boy, six pounds, 13 ounces, 21 inches long. His name is Wesley. Amen. 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 <laughs> Any others? Yes, sir. Sang a grandchild this last Monday. Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh yeah. If y'all didn't hear, Trey has won so many awards that he's sick of them. That is, you're doing good, good. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but our, one of our members uh, that lives with us has been graduated. Amen. Amen. If you didn't catch that, Emily Edison is not only graduating, but graduating with all sorts of medals and honors, and she's going to be all decked out in her cap and gown. Good. Yes, ma'am. All right, good. Watch it. Cannon's coming up from behind. Watch out. All right, now this is the final call. Well, seeing no others, let's stand and go to God with our call to worship. Our call to worship for this morning reads, come into this sacred space to worship God. Be given life and be wise. Let the words of our mouths and the whispering of our hearts. Be according to your will. Let's pray. God of the covenant, you continue to speak in the world today. And we thank you that you have taught us to hear. You have given us the ability to recognize the sound of your voice, for it brings love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. We thank you, God, that we are not left to our own devices or reliant upon wisdom of this age or vague appeals so that we know that you have gifted us with your own Son, our Savior. You have entrusted us with your good news, your gospel. You have shown us the way that is pleasing and acceptable to you. And so we thank you. God, we ask this hour that you would fashion us into people who not only impact the world on your behalf, but into people who equip others to do the same. God, make us not just effective, but make us infectious. Make us infectious in our encouragement, our love, our unity. That we would not only see your will done, but that we would see doers of your will formed. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father.
today's scripture reading is found on page 951 in your pew Bibles, uh, Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning, as we turn to one of the Apostle Paul's letters, uh, we are in for a doozy. If you notice, we picked up about halfway through the sentence for Paul. Uh, really, he has 
He has sections where he's hammering home one central point and he'll circle around it for a whole book sometimes. Uh, and that's certainly the case that's happening here in Ephesians 4. But I want to make it a little bit simpler for us. I think the point he's trying to make is found in that term, equip the saints. Equipping the saints for the work of ministry. See what Paul is doing, Paul is describing the purpose of a church. And the purpose of a church, at least from, from this vantage point, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Of course, we could look at different angles. Last week, we were looking at the mission of the church, our uh, intention in this next year to reform Mission Possible and to go back out there and get back at it. But as we turn to Ephesians, we are considering what we're doing here in the, the one hour, not the 167 other hours God's called us into. <coughs> And what we're seeing specifically today is uh, a part of our sermon series, This Is Us, where we look at not things we're bad at, not things we're good at, but things that we're going to be intentional about in this next year. I believe there's, there's a, a deep wisdom to this idea of equipping the saints. I believe that is the purpose of the church, is to equip the saints. And I, I don't think we do a great job of that in American churches. Candidly, I believe that... Uh, one of the ways the Christian faith has been enculturated here in America is that it's been turned into a bunch of consumer goods. Church becomes less about equipping the saints, it becomes more about having a finalized product. So again, I'm not saying we're good at that, I'm not saying we're bad at that, but I'm just saying we should be intentional about what we're doing whenever we become the church because I see in us a, a deep heart and a deep love for equipping the saints. And so we'll get a little bit more into that here in a moment with some of the facts and the figures. There's some uh, data, a good book that I've read, things like that. But first, let me tell you how, how I feel I was equipped throughout my life and sort of that back and forth between uh, being given consumer goods and being equipped for the work of ministry. See, a lot of people, they, um, they make assumptions about me because I'm a minister, and so they try to fill in the blanks about my background. One of the big ones I get is people assume that I had a uh, family in the ministry. The answer to that is no, but we sure could have used it. <laughs> uh, either that or I, I get the assumption that I was just super religious growing up. And once again, no. Uh, if anything, I was actually, for the mo majority of my life, a Sunday school dropout. I was never um, totally outside of the church, but I would sort of dip in for just a little while, just enough to to get comfortable and then head right back out. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that to just give us a, a sense of what we're looking at today, this idea of equipping the saints. You know, growing up, uh, we went to church. I mean, it was just, you know, that's what you did Sunday morning. Mom loaded us up in the car and we went. But I think I was about seven uh, where my oldest brother, Charles, he, he learned a new trick. He learned that if you just wake up Sunday morning and start complaining like you've never heard before, you could probably get out of it. So every Sunday morning for maybe weeks, maybe months, I don't know, he would wake up and he would complain and misery and, you know, why are you doing this to us? And then, of course, we'd actually get to church and we actually liked it. It was fine. But then, you know, we'd get back in the car and once again it would start up. It's, what are you doing to us? You're torturing us. What? Why? Why? And so, of course, after a while of that, my, my now tormented mom, she let him stay home. And if I remember, he ended up beating Final Fantasy VII that way. So, you know. Well, what ended up happening is shortly after that, my second brother, Alex, uh, I remember him starting it up. He didn't do the, the, why are you doing this to us? He had a slight variation. His was, I don't like it there. It's just old people talking at me, which... Yeah, it's funny. It's, it was the better line. And well, guess what happened after a few weeks of that? There he was. He was at home. I think he was getting his Pokemon up to level 100. Very important work, you know? And so I, I notice a pattern. And I'm the youngest of three boys, and so I, I sort of see what's laid out before me, and I see that I have yet to defeat Ganondorf. And so I start up, right? That's just old people talking at us. What are you doing? And so pretty soon, boom, I was right there, I was at home, I was set. 
You know how exciting it is to be seven years old, left at home, and just given a Nintendo 64? Oh, those were the days. <laughs> well, so it lasted like that for a while. We were sort of in, sort of out. No one could really tell. Uh, it really didn't change until I was about 13. That's when they were redoing the youth room at the church. And all of a sudden, they had video games at church, which, oh, that was a pretty good sale. And so, you know, I showed up and I tried it out, and they had Guitar Hero and a big screen TV, and that was great until I learned that I had friends who had Guitar Hero and a big screen TV. So, uh, once again, I was in, and then I was back out. Another dropout. That lasted a while. Life happened, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, it ended up not being really until college. See, in college, and that's when I found the Disciples of Christ. In college, I remember a, a friend of mine, he asked, he said, Nick, are you a Christian? And I said, uh, yes. He said, why do you not know your Bible? Why do you never pray? Why have I never seen you inside a church building? You know, he was nice about it, but he sort of, he was direct about it too, which that's a lesson in evangelism in itself. But I didn't really have an answer for him. So we ended up going to, to the church he was going to. It was one of those sort of big box churches. And I got nothing against big box churches if that's where someone's called to, but it just wasn't where I was called to. I remember we walked in. They didn't just have free coffee. They had uh, free latte bars. You know, it wasn't sort of the, the piano music. Uh, you got a full rock concert included. And again, you know, different styles are fine. I'm not knocking that. It just, it wasn't for me. And so I tried to pull away, and my friend, he, he asked me, like, what are you doing? I thought you were a Christian. And so I thought I was going to be really tricky on him. I thought I was going to try the same sort of trick that I learned from my brothers growing up. I ended up, you know, coming up with vague moralistic issues. I, well, I'll go to church, but it has to be a church that values the insights of various theologians and philosophers. It has to be a church that... You know, I was a, a science guy, you know, majored in biology. It has to be a church that teaches how science and faith can be compatible. While we're at it, it has to be a church that's open and affirming towards LGBTQ folks. While we're at it, it has to be a church that does great mission projects. While we're at, you know, a thousand of those, and I thought I was in the clear. <laughs> he ended up Googling it. Turns out the disciples of Christ exist. So, you know, I played myself on that one. I go to Disciples of Christ Church the, the first time I go, and it, it was a small congregation. Uh, it was out there in Albuquerque, probably 20, 25 people in an average uh, Sunday. And it checked all the boxes. It, it met my list of demands that I didn't even you know, think was possible. But again, it was 20, 25 people, and predominantly it was people over 60. Uh, and I don't know. It just was one of those things where it checked all the boxes, but I, I just wasn't sure. I was thinking I was going to drop out again, you see. But as that was happening, as I was sort of feeling them out and discerning what my next step was, what ended up happening was a couple of the members, they came to me and they, they said, hey, what do you like about our church? What do you not like about our church? You know, what, what, what do you see? What, what, what would you tweak? You know, they just started asking me questions. They, they weren't just small talk, sort of, hey, how's it going questions. They were real questions. They were asking for a little bit of insight, a little bit of, of uh, my perspective. And it was interesting. It, it was neat. It was the first time somebody in a church had done that. It was the first time that I, I felt like my influence was being asked for in church. See, before that, of course, uh, folks had offered these products. Here's, you know, here's the perfect band. There's nothing wrong with having the perfect band, but here's the perfect band, here's the lattes, here's this or here's that, you know, here's the video game room. And that lasted short term, but, but I think part of the reason that I stuck with the Disciples of Christ, other than them just meeting my absurd list of demands that I came out of thin air with, I think a big part of it was this church, they, they were asking for my influence, they were asking for Hey, how can you be involved? What can we do? Where can we meet you in the middle? Real two-way street conversations. Looking back, you know, I, I think that the other churches I had attended, 
There's nothing wrong with them, but the other churches I had attended, I, I think I would have had to be in 60 before I had my influence asked for. Until then, I think that my appearance would have been valued, but my influence would have been stifled. They would have offered sort of a trinket or a youth room or coffee, stuff like that, but they didn't want anyone's actual input from young people. Years later, I read the book, Growing Young. Uh, it's based on some research coming out of the Fuller Institute, and it gave me a name for some of these things. It, it gave me a name for why that church, the church that had nothing going on for it, but asked for my influence, why that one stuck and the other ones didn't. See, what, what they pointed out is that churches, they can bind themselves up, especially whenever they're a little top-heavy in age. And real quick, we're, we're in a phenomenal position. Uh, the entire denomination is in about the same boat this church is in. And so uh, we're working a little bit on revitalization, and so is everyone else. And so we get to see what's field tested, what's worked, and that's how I came across this recommendation. Uh, and so just, you know, we're being intentional about some things. Don't, don't despair, we're gonna be okay. But what the book pointed out, Growing Young, what that book pointed out is that we can get into a bind. See, the bind up is this, and I'm not saying we're doing this, again, I'm just reporting what the data says so that we can be intentional with it. It says that Sometimes, whether it's with younger folks or outreach in general, the underlying message that can happen in churches is you're welcome to show up, but what's certainly not going to happen is you having any influence whatsoever. It's sort of like trying to make young people or new people or whoever into the church's trophy wife. That can happen a lot in churches. So, like, we're the church, and the new people, they're the accessory to the church. They're just here to look good for us. They're, they're not here to have any influence. They're just sort of here as a, a status symbol. And the book, it goes on, it points out that the proof's kind of in the pudding on that one. The book points out, uh, for instance, that, that there's a little bit of a, a bind up in that, well, say, you would naturally if you were running a Sunday school, you would naturally hand it off to the person who's pretty well got their Sunday school PhD, right? If they've been in Sunday school for 60 years, you'd naturally give them authority over Sunday school. And that's good, that's natural, but you see the issue? Pretty quickly, it could become that the Sunday school uh, has a barrier of entry. You have to have gone to church for 60 years before you can start going to church, you see. He'll point out that, um, the book points out, say there's somebody who's done a project a thousand times before, and so naturally whenever the project comes up to be done again, who do you look to? Probably the person who's done it a thousand times before. By the way, usually they're complaining about having do, done it a thousand times before, but that's another thing. But do you see the bind up that happens is they don't like doing it a thousand times, and they're gonna do it the thousand first time, because they're the best at it. Where's the opportunity for someone else to, to get involved? Where's the influence from, from the people you're trying to bring in? You see the bind up? And so what I hope you hear, heard in my story and what I hope you see in the, the data from growing young is that Paul was right in Ephesians 4. The mission of the church, what we have to understand, the mission of the church is not delivering a final product. It's not having the nicest church, it's not having the greatest program, it's not anything like that. It's not having, you know, the great coffee bar, even though, you know, I like coffee. I'm not knocking that one either. But what the church is about is about equipping the saints. That's the product we're trying to push. See, Ephesians 4, what it's talking about is that we're all members of Christ's body. And this is worth holding on to. This is worth holding in our hearts. We each have a part to play. I'm deadly serious about that. We each here in this room have a part to play. See, whereas in, in churches that have bound themselves up, they, they sort of will call people out onto the field and then immediately put them on the sidelines. What we're called to do is to 
Call people onto the field and start equipping them, start giving them tools. The book, it, it calls this idea, calls this idea keychain leadership. And I think it's what I saw in that Disciples of Christ Church, which, by the way, has done phenomenal work since, but they call it keychain leadership. They explain the, the name of it with a question. How long does somebody need to be at your church before they're handed the keys? Not just the physical keys, but keys of leadership, keys of influence, keys of authority, that sort of thing. And of course, I'm not proposing that the answer should be, you know, five minutes. I'm not proposing we, I don't know, make someone an elder overnight who just showed up or anything like that. But at the same time, we know that that, that answer can't be, well, they should have been here 60 years ago either. Right? That it has to be somewhere in the middle. Because what you see, of course, is that the quicker that you're bringing people in with all their influence, all their authority, all their self, and letting them take part, letting them be a part of the church like we're a part of the church, the quicker you're going to pick up energy, the quicker, the quicker you're going to pick up new ideas, the quicker you're going to just have something good going on. And so... Where that leaves us, church, is that uh, this book, it, it gave me something of a paradigm shift. It gave me names for things that I didn't know I was asking for, things that I didn't know were even terms to look for. But what it's called us to see is that the church is Christ's body. We are called together to equip each other for service. What we're trying to do here is deeply form people, not not have a great product or even a great mission trip. Ultimately, what the church is about is building people up, building people up, making them equipped, making them ready for things. Everybody has a way of being Christ's body together. Everybody has a special gift that they are able to work on and help nuance. And so what this tells us, if we've been in the church for, you know, a little while longer than, than your average folk, uh, what I believe are calling is, is to help nuance and to, to help grow people up, not to, you know, do things perfectly ourselves. I'll tell you, that that is a difficult thing for me to do. You know, whenever I'm good at something, I want to be the one who does it. It's natural, right? But you see here in this book and, and just in the nature of church that we're called into, as evidenced in Ephesians 4, is we're not supposed to be good at it. We're supposed to be good at building people for it. Where that leaves me and where I want to leave us today is whenever we feel like we've become the expert, I believe we have a duty as Christians not to stay the expert, but to invest in others. Christianity, it's a, it's a quickly uh, recursive sort of model. Our mission ultimately is not to perform well. Our mission is to equip the saints for the works of service. May it be so.
This is the Lord's table, and Christ invites you to share in this meal of grace. Christ wants you within this circle. All are welcome. Please come forward using the outer aisles and return to your seats using the center aisles. Offering plates are on the table. Let us present with joy our offerings of commitment and support for the work of Christ's church. The table which Christ does invite us into uh, was inaugurated like this. On the night Jesus was to be betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. He lifted it up, he gave thanks for it. He blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he gave thanks for it. He blessed it. He said, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you, drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. Let us come forward.
Please pray with me. Wondrous creator, you provide for our strength and gladness through the privilege of human connection, creativity, and labor. You supply all we need. With grateful hearts, we offer you these signs of our work that you may use them all to glorify your name in us and in all creation. Amen. At this time, if there are any who feel called to join First Christian Church in membership, please do come forward. Uh, a brief note on that, just to reiterate, we do not have any exclusive member benefits here, but, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. But as we look to the changing of the church fiscal year, we're gonna be having sign-up sheets for uh, joining different ministries. And so if you wanna be put to work, joining up's a good idea. But with that, receive now this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>